As I mentioned in the previous module on deterrence, I am presenting some approaches that one may consider when faced with puzzling oral feeding issues in infants. This information is not foolproof by any means. However, they may give you some ideas of approaches that you may want to consider when evidence-based support is lacking. An important consideration to think about as you puzzle over what you can do is to rely on your own common sense. Researchers like myself advocate evidence-based information. However, we also realize that the latter is not always available. Common sense, on the other hand, is. For instance, when you see a baby turning blue while feeding, common sense tells you to stop regardless of whether you have identified the cause or not. So let's begin. In this slide, I am expressing the position that I take regarding infant oral feeding difficulties, what I call a why philosophy for the long term. Indeed, knowing that many preterm infants demonstrate long-term feeding difficulties and even aversions as we see in feeding disorder clinics, we need to train our babies to develop good functional oral feeding skills. What have our preterm infants encountered prior to being introduced to oral feeding? First, being born prematurely, we know that this infant's maturation will lag behind that of an infant born term. Maturing outside the womb or ex utero is not the same as maturing inside the womb or in utero. As such, these infants should not be expected to perform like term infants. But we can expect that with time and patience, their skills will improve. Second, following a premature birth, babies are exposed daily to different types of negative facial sensory inputs, for instance, feeding tubes, eye exams, frequent suctions, tape on their cheeks, and so on. So taking the above into consideration, in my opinion, it becomes more important for oral feeding to be a positive oral sensory experience than to expect our babies to complete their feeding. Positive experience will decrease oral aversion not only over the short term when they are hospitalized, but also over the long term when they go home. Additionally, by giving our babies time to adapt to oral feeding and by not pressuring them to complete a feeding, we are also allowing them to fine-tune their skills. Better skills will naturally lead to better performance. Namely, they will feed more safely and more efficiently. Therefore, in regards to oral feeding, we ought to think quality over quantity. It is important to remember that preemies are not full-term babies, so it is not appropriate to expect the same level of performance when they feed. Why? Their sucking skills are immature, therefore they are not as efficient. They have poor endurance with unstable behavioral state, therefore they cannot feed for a long time. However, the dilemma is that as caregivers, we are under pressure to have them attain full overfeeding in order to discharge them earlier. What is the current practice? What we are looking for is an adequate weight gain, around 10 to 15 gram per kilogram per day on average, safety to minimize O2 desaturations, apnea, bradycardia, and or aspiration, and success to complete a feeding within an allotted time, around 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the hospital. And the reason for the latter is to limit energy expenditure in order to favor weight gain. What should our goals be? I am in agreement with our concern regarding adequate weight gain and safety, as mentioned in the previous slide. But I would like to redefine success not in terms of the ability to complete a feeding, but rather in terms of the ability to develop safe and efficient oral feeding skills. Remember, oral feeding should be a pleasant, nurturing experience to minimize feeding aversion. 
So what could be some simple common sense approaches that we can use? I usually ask myself two questions. One, if I were a baby, how would I want to be treated? And two, as a caregiver, what can I do to help my baby? So let's start with, I am a baby. Okay, I'm the baby now, and I'm feeding. But as time goes on, I'm sliding down. Can someone help me readjust my position, please? Why? To facilitate organization and breathing? To facilitate safer swallowing? To decrease risks of reflux? How can you help me? By holding me slightly upright and cradled? By positioning my body and head in midline? by ensuring that my upper chest and head are supported and I am not crouching. I'm tired. I need to rest. Please give me a break. Limit feeding duration, if necessary. Why? It reduces fatigue, risk of aspiration, feeding aversion. How can you do that? Decrease the number of oral feedings per day or feeding duration? Complement with tube feeding to preserve caloric intake. Follow feeding specialist recommendations if consulted. I'm learning how to feed. Please slow down. I can't eat this fast. Let infants feed at their own pace, since we do not know the maturity level of their oral feeding skills. Why? to allow infants to develop safe and efficient functional feeding skills, as we talked about, to have a positive experience about oral feeding, so they are less likely to develop oral feeding aversion. How can you do that? Give infants control to regulate milk flow, rest if necessary, and breathe. Okay, now I'm the caregiver. What can I do to help my baby move along? If I see wide jaw excursion and excessive drooling, I can provide cheek and jaw support. What would this do? The wide jaw excursion and poor lip seal are due to your baby's immature muscle tone. By gently sustained pressure on both cheeks, pulling slightly forward to tighten the lips, and limiting the wide jaw excursion by gently pushing up under the chin, you are helping increase the muscle tone. But make sure you are not impeding on his breathing and self-pacing. I can also help my baby pace himself or herself. Why? Some babies do not stop sucking and forget to breathe. They have not yet coordinated suck-swallow-breathe. Pacing them also gives them time to rest and breathe. It also gives them time to re-coordinate sucking, swallowing, and breathing if necessary. How can I do that? Observe how many sucks before your baby shows signs of struggle. For instance, after three to five sucks. This may vary between babies. If so, after that number of suck, tilt the bottle back without removing the nipple. Or another thing you can do is to pull the nipple out to let him breathe. However, be careful as this may disorganize him and he may not be interested in continuing to feed. There are other approaches that can be used to regulate milk flow. Here are three examples. You can increase viscosity by using thickeners such as rice cereal for formula or human milk fortifier for human milk in order to increase bolus consistency. However, in practice, it is difficult to replicate the appropriate viscosity identified by modified swallow studies once by the bedside. A second example is to adjust the angle of the feeding bottle. I am talking here about decreasing the hydrostatic pressure inside the bottle so as to decrease milk drip. A third example is to try different types of bottle nipples, which is commonly done nowadays. Indeed, nipples labeled as slow, medium, or fast flow are readily available on the market. But it remains unclear 
whether changing nipples really help. Insofar as infants with no known central nervous system issues have been shown to regulate flow rate by changing their sucking pattern. So in summary, I have presented in this module my personal viewpoint on some important considerations regarding oral feeding in preterm infants. First, it is more important to think about quality of oral feeding skills than quantity, i.e. how much can an infant take at a feeding when transitioning from tube to oral feeding. Second, it is important for a multidisciplinary team to deliver the same message to baby and mother. And third, when puzzled, our common sense can help. For instance, pretend that you are the baby. How would you like to be treated? And pretend that you are the caregiver. How can you help your baby?